handful of men will rule business and the nation for half a century with their brilliance and blind ambition. They know no bounds, recognize no authority but their own. The people were called the robber barons by their critics and I suppose would be called industrial titans by their admirers were really the, the agents of the first stage of modern industrial capitalism. Uh, an enormous number of the, of the big corporations that are still a major part of American life were created in the late 19th century, most of them by very talented, very aggressive, often very ruthless individual entrepreneurs. And their achievements are extraordinary. Uh, they transformed the American economy. Uh, but they also did so very often in a very brutal, harsh way, which is what led them to be called the robber barons. The most powerful of these men is J.P. Morgan, the man who finances the railroads and the rest of American industry. He has a vision of a bold new industrial nation towering over the world, and he makes it happen. His origins are hardly humble. His father is a rich international banker who worries over his son's often impulsive judgments. Young Morgan gets a big boost from the Civil War. He sees the conflict as a business opportunity, not a cause, and profits greatly. He'll soon control four of the six major railroads in the country. Banks, insurance companies, industrial corporations, a financial empire worth billions. At a lavish dinner party in 1900, a close associate of Andrew Carnegie convinces Morgan to buy out Carnegie's vast steel holdings. A few weeks later, Carnegie scrawls the asking price of $480 million on a piece of scrap paper. And U.S. Steel, the world's largest industrial enterprise, is created. Andrew Carnegie, unlike Morgan, had not been born with the proverbial silver spoon in his mouth. Carnegie is a genuinely self-made man. From his immigrant father, an impoverished Scottish weaver, young Carnegie learns both the value of a dollar and the importance of social justice. Working as a railroad official, Carnegie grasps a simple idea better than anyone else. You can't build railroads without rails. So he invests in iron, eventually controlling the industry. And when iron gives way to steel, he dominates that industry too. There was tremendous resentment of the way the wealthy used their wealth. That was one reason why people like Andrew Carnegie and to some degree John D. Rockefeller were such conspicuous philanthropists because they were concerned that the wealthy class was going to become a target of national anger if they didn't legitimize themselves in some way in, in the eyes of the nation. That worked for Carnegie. He became, after having been one of the most brutal uh, steel barons of the late 19th century, he became, in the last years of his life, a sort of fuzzy, beloved philanthropist. In his Gospel of Wealth, Carnegie proclaims, This, then, is held to be the duty of the man of wealth to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display and extravagance, to consider all surplus revenues which come to him simply as trust funds, to produce the most beneficial results for the community, the man of wealth thus becoming the mere trustee and agent for his poorer brethren. Still, many prominent citizens wonder if the growing gap between rich and poor will do lasting harm to American democracy. 